Well, hello everyone. Let's get started on another great chemistry lesson today. We're going to be looking at lesson eight, Lewis dot structures. If you'll get out your study guides and turn to lesson eight, we'll get started. All right, lesson eight, Lewis structures or Lewis dot structures. All right. Now, we have already talked about um, essentially Lewis symbols and how to draw a Lewis symbol for um, an element. Now, what we're going to do is learn how to draw what are called Lewis dot structures or Lewis structures. And essentially, a Lewis structure shows us how atoms are connected to one another um, through covalent bonding. Okay. So let me give you some examples of what a Lewis structure looks like. So what we have here is a picture of the American scientist, Gilbert Lewis. Um, Gilbert Lewis is the one responsible for designing and developing the idea of Lewis structures and therefore named after him, um, Gilbert Lewis. Okay, so what is a Lewis structure? As you can see in front of you on your screen is a diagram representing two Lewis structures, one for water. Okay, now water, remember, has the chemical formula of H2O, but the chemical formula, all it does is tell us the ratios, the two to one ratio, but it doesn't really show how the atoms are connected to one another to form a covalent bond. In other words, are the hydrogens connected to one another? Is the hydrogen connected to an oxygen? I mean, uh, how, is it, how is it all structured? Well, that's what a Lewis dot structure is going to do for us, is to show us the connectivity and show us the bonds and the types of bonds um, formed between the atoms. So uh, the first structure that we're looking at is a structure of water. Um, each dot, represents a valence electron. Um, now dots that are paired between two atoms, this is a covalent bond as we've talked about before. And um, we usually call this a bonding pair. So I'm gonna write this a bonding bonding pair. Right, and all bonding pairs are covalent bonds. All right, and we always have to use two electrons to represent uh, that covalent bond. So, how many uh, bonding pairs do we actually have? Well, we have two of them for water. And notice that the hydrogens are not bonded to one another, but the hydrogens are actually bonded to the oxygen. And oxygen is in the middle, and we call the oxygen the central atom, okay? So this is the central okay, the central atom, all right? And we'll be discussing more about what that means um, in a bit, but uh, essentially, as it says, it is the atom that all the other elements are bonded to um, and surrounded by, okay? So it's central. The other uh, pair of electrons are the non-bonding pair, okay? So here's a non-bonding pair and here's another non-bonding pair. These non-bonding pairs of electrons are also known famously as a lone pair of electrons. And we will use this term lone pair uh, quite often, okay? In describing a molecule structure. Uh, to have a complete and correct Lewis structure, you must indicate the lone pairs, um, which are the non-bonding pairs, as well as the bonding pairs. Um, and, they, and that has to be there in order to have a correct Lewis structure, okay? Now, sometimes we can substitute the bonding pair, those two dots in the bonding pair with a hyphen or a dashed line. So we can kind of show you what that might look like for water, so if I have my oxygen, my central atom, instead of the two dots, I will represent or replace those dots with hyphens, OK? 
okay? And then my lone pairs, like so, okay? And that's what uh, an, another acceptable uh, structure for water can be using the uh, dashed lines or the uh, between the bonds instead of the um, dots, okay? Now let's let's go over and look at this next one. So this next structure that we're looking at is um, C O C L two. Okay. So again, this is the chemical formula where it shows the ratio of one carbon to one oxygen to two chlorines. But the chemical formula does not tell us how the atoms are connected or structured together. So if we draw the Lewis dot structure for the uh, molecule, it gives us a better understanding. We can see that the carbon is bonded to the oxygen and the carbon is also bonded to two chlorines. And the chlorines are not connected, nor is the oxygen connected to the chlorine, okay? So that makes, or sorry, carbon the central atom here, okay? Okay, the central atom. and everything else is bonded around that central atom. Now, the interesting thing is, is that we have um, between the carbon and oxygen, we actually have four dots that are represented here. Um, and those four dots represent what we call a double bond. In, in reality, this is one covalent bond and this is a second covalent bond. So we can say that there are two covalent bonds um, between the oxygen and carbon. And since there's two covalent bonds there, we just call it a double bond, right? And so um, in a double bond, uh, there's gonna be four electrons being shared between uh, the two atoms, okay? And then of course we have our lone pairs right here. And then the chlorine, uh, this would be a single bond and this is a single bond. And then we have a bunch of lone pairs around each of the chlorines. And there is no lone pairs around the carbon in this particular molecule, okay? So here's the keywords. You need to be able to identify a central atom. You need to be able to identify the lone pairs. You need to be able to identify the bonding pairs. And in some situations, uh, some bonds form, uh, or some atoms form double bonds or even triple bonds. And um, you need to identify the difference between a single, double, and triple bond in these Lewis structures. All right, so that's the basics. Now, guess what? You get the opportunity to learn how to take a chemical formula <laughs> and uh, from scratch, draw the Lewis dot structure for um, any molecule that I pretty much uh, throw out at you, okay? So how do we do this? Good question. All right, before we get into how we do that, um, I want to remind you of some things about valence electrons because it become very important that you can calculate the number of valence electrons for each element that is in uh, the molecule that we're, we're looking at or focusing on to draw the Lewis structure for. So remember that in the first group here, all of those elements have one valence electron. So all of these are one valence electron. In group two, we have two valence electrons. Um, 13, group 13, right? The last digit is a three. So these have three. Group 14, the last digit is a four. So these have four. And then five, six, and seven valence electrons. And group 18 ends in an eight, right? So it has eight valence electrons. The only exception is this poor helium that only has two valence electrons. So don't forget that, okay? The rest though, in group 18 or the noble gases all have eight valence electrons, okay? Remember that magical number eight, okay, for an octet. So it will be important that you be able to add up the total number of valence electrons 
for a molecule. And so you take essentially each individual element that is involved in the molecule. So let's go back to say um, water, okay? And what we need to do is to find the total valence electron number or count for water is you go to hydrogen and you say, oh, look at that. There is um, one electron for each hydrogen. So therefore we have two valence electrons and then oxygen has six valence electrons, right? So we add those up, the six plus the two hydrogens gives us eight valence electrons. So water will have a total of eight valence electrons in the outer shells between uh, these three atoms that make up water, hydrogen and oxygen, okay? So you're gonna have to do that um, in order to draw a Lewis structure, okay? So now we have everything we need in order to begin uh, looking at Lewis structures here. So in your notes, you have a, uh, a simple set of rules. They may seem complex rules at first, but um, essentially you could say besides rules, maybe steps. Um, and, and this is kind of the steps that need to be taken in order to draw a, a Lewis dot structure. Now, there are various um, approaches to drawing a Lewis dot structure. In other words, different steps um, you can see in different textbooks or from different instructors. Um, but the steps that I'm going to show you, um, I have found to be not only the easiest steps in some cases, but are extensive and able to draw Lewis structures for anything that I throw out at you pretty much. OK, if, if there's a structure that can be done, these steps will do it for you. So what I want you to do is basically learn these steps really well, because you're gonna be drawing Lewis structures um, throughout the year. This is not the only time you're gonna do this, okay? Lewis structures are really important um, in, our, in, in our study of chemistry, okay? So let's go through each of the steps before we start actually using them. And um, when we start using these steps to draw Lewis structures, what I would recommend you do is just have these steps out available to you and then let's go through each one, okay? Now, caution, extreme caution here. Do not skip a step. I repeat, do not skip a step. Now, I know some of you are gonna go, oh, eh, you know, I, whatever. I don't need to do that. I, I can remember, uh-huh, all right. I've heard that so many times and I get uh, students that will spend 20 minutes on trying to draw a structure and they'll go, it can't be done, I can't do this. And I'm like, well, did you go through all the steps? And they'll be like, well, no, not, I didn't do them all. Well, that's probably your problem. So go back and do those steps. And sure enough, within, a matter of one minute of just going through those steps, um, each step um, in order, then they're like, oh, okay, I can do this. Yeah, you can, okay? Just go through the steps, trust me on this. I've been doing this a long time now, okay? So let's look at step number one, okay? The first thing you need to do anytime you draw a Lewis structure is to count the total number of valence electrons for each atom that's represented in the molecule. Just much like we just did with water, where he took the molecule water and counted up the total number of valence electrons for it. Use the periodic table if you need to. Now, what if you have an ion? Um, you know, in other words, the molecule has an ionic charge on it. Well, then you look at uh, 1A and 1B. 1A says, uh, if it's a negative, uh, charged atom, an anion, then all you have to do is add the charge number to the valence electron total. So in other words, if your charge is a negative two, um, then you're going to add two valence electrons to your total um, amount. Or if it's a negative three charge, 
then you're going to add three valence electrons to your total amount, right? Well, what if it's a positive, a cation, for instance? Well, you're going to subtract now instead of adding. So if it's a positive two, you're going to take away two valence electrons from the total. Or if it's a positive three, you're going to take away three electrons from the total, okay? So that's how you deal with, with ions and counting up the total number of valence electrons, all right? Now, once you have that, here is something to remember. To really do a solid Lewis structure, the total number of valence electrons needs to be an even number, okay? Needs to be an even number. If you get an odd number, then you're just not going to do it, okay? So sometimes if we skip that step, uh, we can't figure out the structure. It's because it's an odd number of electrons. And if you would have taken and counted up those electron numbers, you would have had such a big problem because you would have known right away, oh, I can't draw the Lewis structure for this particular atom or molecule because it has an odd number of valence electrons, okay? Or total odd number of valence electrons, okay? All right, so even number there. So don't forget that. Now, number two is all you need to do now is take and determine which atom should be your central atom. Now, we just talked about central atoms, and that's the atom that all the other elements are bonded to, okay? Now, how do you determine the central atom? Well, it's usually the atom that needs the most electrons to fill its valence shell. Right, so if you look between carbon, or sorry, uh, hydrogen and oxygen, right, in water, oxygen is going to need uh, two more electrons to fill its valence shell, where the hydrogen only needs one. So that's why we place oxygen in the center for water, because it needs oxygen needs more electrons to fill its valence shell. Okay. So you may have to use the periodic table a little bit to, to think about, okay, how many more electrons does this atom need in order to have a full shell, all right, compared to another one, all right? And that's how you're going to determine the central atom. Now, there are some times where you have two elements in the molecule that have the same exact need for, um, to fill their shell the same need of valence electrons to fill the shell. So how do you determine um, which element is gonna be in the center then if they both need the same number? Well, let's do this. If, if you have two atoms that need the same number of valence electrons to fill their shell, use the element that is lowest down on the periodic table to be your central atom. So for instance, if you are if you got sulfur and oxygen and you're trying to decide, okay, well, sulfur and oxygen both need two electrons to fill a shell. So which one is it gonna be? Is it gonna be sulfur or oxygen as the central atom? Well, sulfur is further down the periodic table, right? We're top to bottom. Sulfur is a little bit down from oxygen and right underneath, in fact. And so sulfur, is gonna be your um, central atom in this case. And if you go by that rule of thumb, usually 99% of the time you will be correct, okay? So kind of think of that um, in terms if they need the same uh, electron number, valence electron number to fill their valence shell further down in the center. Okay, let's go to number three. So rule number three basically says, now we're gonna start uh, connecting the elements together around the central atom. So all the other elements are going to form covalent bonds by using two dots, okay? Remember, two dots represents a covalent bond. So you're gonna start placing all of the other elements around the central atom using two dots uh, to create a covalent bond, okay? Now, once you've done that, then you go to step number four. 
In step number four, this is something that's often missed by students as well. So do not skip step number four. Don't do it, I'm warning you now. What you're gonna do on step number four is you're gonna take the valence electrons that you used, okay, to make um, the covalent bonds and you're gonna count them up. So if you made two covalent bonds, that means you used four electrons or four dots, okay? And what you're gonna do is take those four electrons and subtract it from the total number of valence electrons that you first calculated in step number one, okay? So if you had eight valence electrons total, and then you made two bonds, two covalent bonds, that would be four electrons then. So you would take eight minus four, and that would leave you with four valence electrons left over, okay? So don't, you need, you need step four because you need to know how many valence electrons you have left over to work with, okay? Once you've done that, you can go to step number five. In step number five, uh, you need to do this correctly or you're gonna have some problems, okay? In step number five, you're gonna take the remaining electrons, the leftover electrons that you have from the total amount, and you're going to be distributing those electrons as lone pairs, okay? You're gonna take the remaining electrons and distribute them as lone pairs, all right? And you're gonna start, and this is really important, you're gonna start on the atoms on the outside, not the central atom. The central atom should be the very last atom that you ever put lone pairs on, okay? The very last one. If you skip this and you put lone pairs on the central atom first, you're gonna wind up in having some complications and you're gonna be pulling your hair out saying, why does this not work, okay? Trust me on this, okay? You're gonna start placing lone pairs on the outside atoms first, and you're going to do so until that atom has a full valence shell. Once the atom has a full valence shell, you'll go to the next atom and place lone pairs on it until it has a full valence shell. And you're gonna keep on doing that until you get to the central atom. And then you can put any leftover electrons on the central atom. Again, any leftover electrons can go as a pair on the central atom. I'm gonna say that one more time. Any leftover electrons after all the other elements have had full complete valence shells or complete octets, okay, or duplets in the case of hydrogen, right, then you can then finally go to the central atom and place any extra electrons on the central atom as lone pairs, okay? So that is the first five steps. The last step, number six, may or may not occur, okay? If you find that the central atom is deficient in electrons, so there's no more electrons to create a lone pair with around the central atom to give it a full shell. If there's no more lone pairs and the central atom um, is deficient in electrons and cannot have a full shell, then what you're gonna need to do is steal neighboring electrons from an adjacent atom, a lone pair, and create a double or triple bond. And I'll show you what that looks like in a moment, okay? Um, but you might have to borrow some electrons from a neighboring atom in order to create a full shell for the central atom. And by doing so, you're gonna create a double or a triple bond, okay? So that's possible. So step six, uh, may or may occur depending on the compound, if it's gonna end up with double or triple bonding, okay? So there are the six steps uh, to create um, a valence electron or to create a Lewis structure, 
All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to practice, right? We are going to practice. Um, now, we've already looked at the uh, Lewis dot structure for water. We know what it looks like. But what we're going to do is we're going to go through all the steps, um, the six steps, if needs be, in order to, to draw the Lewis structure of water so that you have an idea of how this is going to look, OK? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this actually on the board. So um, I'm going to go to the board here. And uh, you can follow along with me. All right, and I'm actually going to uh, essentially draw these up here. Let me arrange this so that we can uh, see this well. Okay. See it okay? All right, so the first one we're going to look at is water, right? So, water. Okay, and again, we got to start um, at each step. So step number one is we need to count up the valence electron. So I'm going to just put H2O, the chemical formula, and next to it, I'm going to put the total valence electron number. So maybe total here. Okay. And so I go to my periodic table, like we showed you before, and I look at oxygen, and oxygen has six valence electrons. Okay. And then I look at hydrogen, and hydrogen only has one valence electron, but I have two hydrogens. So that's a total of two valence electrons for hydrogen and six for oxygen. Add them together, and I have eight total. Okay. Now, remember I said that this number has to be an even number. If it's an even number, we're good to go, and it is. So now I can go to step number two. And by the way, not an ion, so I don't need to add or take away valence electrons from the total number, okay? So what I'm gonna do now is go directly to step two, and step two tells me I need to pick a central atom. So the central atom needs the most electrons to fill its valence shell. In this case, it's gonna be oxygen, right? Oxygen needs two more electrons, fill its valence shell. Hydrogen only needs one to fill its valence shell. So I'm going to put oxygen as my central atom. Bingo. Step one, step two is done. Now, step three says now I need to start making the covalent bonds with the additional elements around my central atom. So I have two hydrogens and I'm going to begin to um, build those covalent bonds by using a pair of dots. Okay. So I'm going to take and build a covalent bond right there, the two dots, okay? And then another two dots here to build that second covalent bond, all right? So I've used up all the atoms now, and they're all covalently bonded to the central atom, okay? So I've done my step three. Now I'm going to go to step four. This is the step I told you please don't forget to do. It's often missed by students, okay? Now, step four is I'm gonna take my bonding electrons now, and I'm going to add them up, which is one, two, three, four, right? Four bonding electrons. And I'm going to subtract that from my total original amount, all right? And so eight minus four is four, okay? Now, what that tells me is I have four valence electrons to play with. That's all I have left over. I can't adjust that number at all, all right? And that's where students get some problems at because they try to say, oh, I need to you know, uh, play around there, but I can't, okay? I only have four and I can only use four more electrons, okay? So let's go to step um, five then. Okay, now step five says I need to start distributing these remaining four electrons um, around the atoms to make full valent shells as lone pairs. And I need to start on my outside atoms first and then go to my central atom, okay? 
So I'm going to pick my first hydrogen here, and I'm going to ask myself, does it need any more electrons to get a full valence shell? The answer is no. Hydrogen only needs two electrons to have a full shell. Because it's sharing these two electrons here, hydrogen now has a full valence shell. And this hydrogen needs no more electrons. Okay, we can say the same thing about the second hydrogen then. It has a full valence shell because it's sharing these two electrons and therefore hydrogen is good. So now I can go to my central atom, oxygen. Now is oxygen fine? Does oxygen have a full shell? The answer is absolutely not, okay? Right now it has only got four electrons that are being shared, two here and two there. So oxygen, uh, only four electrons are in the valence shell for oxygen at this point. But I do have some other electrons available that I can help fix this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take two of those dots, two of those electrons, and make two dots as a lone pair. And then I got two more left, create another lone pair. That uses up all of my electrons now, I have nothing left over, okay? So the question, and I have to use them, okay? I can't have any leftover electrons, okay? So now at this point, is oxygen got a full octet? Does it have a full valence shell? And we can count that. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and finally eight electrons. That's the magic number, eight. So oxygen has a full, complete valent shell, all right? And so we have the correct Lewis structure for water right here, and we're good to go, okay? And that's that's uh, essentially the steps that we take in order to do that, okay? Let's do another one. Let's do carbon dioxide, all right? All right, so CO2, I'm gonna write the formula, carbon dioxide and the valence electrons, okay? So I want you to take a moment and I want you to calculate the total number of valence electrons for carbon dioxide, okay? Do that and I'll come back, and we'll put the number up there. All right, you should have calculated what? 16 total valence electrons, okay? That's good because it's an even number, we can do it, all right? Now, I have only 16 electrons available to me to create this structure. I can't add any more, I can't take away, I must use all 16. Okay, here we go. Step one is done. Step two, I need to locate my central atom. Which one is gonna be my central atom? Is it gonna be oxygen or is it gonna be carbon? Well, carbon needs four more electrons, four more to fill its valence shell. Oxygen, we've already said only needs two, okay? Hint, newsflash, carbon will always be a central atom, always, okay? It will be essentially the element in, in the 90% of molecules that will always be the one most deficient in electrons. And that's why whenever uh, you see a molecule like DNA or proteins, carbohydrates, fats, whatever, you've been in biology, carbon is everywhere. And it's always bonded to one another and it's always central. And that is because carbon is so deficient in electrons, it has to be in the center, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and put carbon as my central atom. That's step number two. Step number three is to take and make covalent bonds with the other elements around the central atom. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna put one here. And I'm gonna change things up and I'm gonna put another one over here, okay? Just a variety, okay? Doesn't really matter right now of where you actually put those covalent bonds as long as they're uh, those covalent bonds are indicated on that central atom, okay? So that's step uh, three. Step four, all right? I'm going to add up the bonding electrons that I've used and subtract them from my total. I've used four, right? 
So how many do I have left? 10, okay? So I have 10 electrons to play with. Oh, not 10, I can't even count. 12, okay? 12 electrons to play with uh, for the rest of the structure, right? All right, so let's go to step number five and let's start placing electrons um, as lone pairs um, around these elements to give them full shells now. Now, we're gonna start on the outside and that's the oxygen. So we'll start with oxygen. It doesn't matter which one you start with. I'm gonna go ahead and start with this one here and then I'll work my way to the other one, okay? Well, oxygen is quite deficient in electrons right now. It currently only has two, right? Not good enough. So I'm gonna start putting lone pairs. That's one lone pair. This is another lone pair. And then finally, one more lone pair. Now that should give oxygen eight electrons at this point. Two, four, six, eight, okay? That's awesome. So what I've done is I've used six out of the 12, all right? So I've used six out of 12, I have six remaining now. That's it, it's all the electrons I have left over. So now I'm gonna have to go, I'm skipping the central atom, right? I can't, use, I can't put any electrons on that central atom and fix it until I use the outside atoms first. So now I come over to the other oxygen and I'm gonna fix that and get um, this oxygen a full shell by placing some lone pairs around it. So I'm gonna start here, one lone pair, two lone pairs, three lone pairs, and that should fix that oxygen. But I've used six. Good thing I had six, right? So I don't have any left over. I've used up all of my valence electrons that are allotted to me, okay? That's it, done, right? Uh-oh, we got a problem. Uh-oh, my central atom. It's way deficient, right? It really needs four more electrons to have a full shell, right? We already talked about that oxygen typically, or carbon typically has a deficiency in electrons. Well, here we are, right? And uh, what are we gonna do? We don't have any more electrons to play with, okay? That's where we get to step six. Now, step six, if you recall, what we're gonna do is we're gonna borrow, quote, borrow, some electrons from an adjacent atom, okay? And hopefully those electrons that we borrow will help us. Now, we're gonna create a double bond though because those electrons that we're going to take as lone pairs still need to really be belonging to that other atom, okay? Where we're just borrowing, we're not taking them permanently. So what we're gonna do is take a pair of electrons here I'm gonna go ahead and create a double bond now between the carbon and oxygen. Now, still, the oxygen is still okay, right? Because with that, I still have two electrons here being shared, two here, two here, and two here. That's still eight. So oxygen is still good. But what it does by creating that double bond here is it's letting carbon have two additional electrons that is being shared between the carbon and oxygen. And so now we're getting better. Now, it is possible I could take another two uh, electrons and create a triple bond, but it's better to create another double bond here than a triple bond, all right? And that's the case in, in a lot of situations, not all, but in a lot, okay? So what I'm gonna actually do is kind of spread this wealth out a little bit and by taking two electrons here and creating a number, another double bond there. And what that's gonna do is it keeps my eight electrons on that oxygen, but gives me an additional two electrons on the carbon. So now, carbon now has how many electrons? Well, it has eight, two, four, six, eight. So it's sharing a bunch of electrons, eight electrons total, right? Eight electrons with the two oxygens by creating those double bonds. And that's okay because carbon is like, hey, you know what? I have a full shell. That's all that really matters, even though I'm forming these double bonds and I'm sharing electrons with the oxygen and so forth. It's okay, okay? So this is what carbon dioxide would look like. Now, as I mentioned before, we can, we can 
change these bonding electrons into dashes, okay? I'm gonna do that right now. So I'm gonna take and make a double bond. There's, there's two dashes for each covalent bond. And then here's my oxygen. And then I'm gonna create another double bond. And then I still need my lone pairs. I have to keep the lone pairs. I cannot forget to put them in or my structure would be wrong, okay? And so there's our structure for carbon dioxide right there, okay? I don't think it's that hard. You just gotta follow the steps and, and learn and practice them, okay? Let's do um, one more, and then I'm gonna give you an opportunity to practice some, some of these on your own, okay? So the last one there in your notes is the carbonate ion. All right, so let, that's, this is gonna be our first ion that we're gonna look at. So CO3, two minus, okay? So the first thing we need to do, right, is calculate the total number of valence electrons that the carbonate ion would have, okay? But don't forget, this is a negatively two charged ion, which means once we get the total number, we need to add in two more to that total because this is an ion, an anion, okay? So add two more to your total and you should have it, okay? Give you a minute, I'll come back and uh, look at this. All right. You should have come up with a total of 24 electrons with the uh, additional two electrons added for that total to make it 24, okay, for the ion. All right, so step one is done. The fact is it's an even number, so we're good to go. So now what we're gonna do is go to step two. And step two, we have to determine the central atom. Guess what, there's a carbon in there. It's gonna be our central atom, right? So I'm gonna place carbon there. And now what I'm gonna do is uh, go to step three and you'll start making the covalent bonds between the oxygens. I'm gonna put one there, I'm gonna put one there. Okay, I'm just putting them around. One here sounds good, like so, okay? So now I've used up all the rest of my atoms and bonded it to the central atom there, okay? Good, now go to step four. And I'm gonna take my bonding electrons and subtract it from my total. So I've used up six, right? So subtract six from 24. So if you need to, you can always pull out your calculator, right? Those that are not good at math like myself. And I get 18 electrons left over, okay? So I have to use these 18 electrons, um, all of them to complete this structure but I can only use 18, remember that, only 18. So what I'm gonna do is start um, creating lone pairs on the outside atoms first, these oxygens, and then I'll focus on the central atom after, all right? So again, I'm gonna focus on this oxygen. This oxygen is really deficient, so it needs a pair there, a pair there, and a pair there, okay? So that's six electrons that I've used out of 18, right? And then I'm going to come over here, and this oxygen also needs three lone pairs, okay? And so now I've used 12 out of the 18, right? And so then I look at this next oxygen, and whoa, I need some electrons here. And now I've used 18 out of the remaining amount, right? I don't have any electrons left, right? For the poor central atom. Now, it's a little bit better shaped than, be, with, than carbon dioxide. Carbon is still deficient in two electrons, right? It's sharing two here, sharing two there, and two there, but it's still deficient. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna create a double bond. I'm gonna go to step six. So I don't care which oxygen you're gonna borrow from, but you gotta borrow from one of them. 
And you're, so I'm, I'm just going to choose this one, okay? You can choose this one or this one, it doesn't matter. But I'm going to choose this one, and I'm going to create a double bond there, okay? And now the oxygen still has eight, right? Two, four, six, eight. So I haven't disrupted oxygen's valence shell and having a full shell. I haven't done that. All I've done is helped out carbon because now carbon has a full shell. Two, four, six, eight. Okay. Even though it's being shared. All right. Now, this structure is almost complete. Because it's an ion, I have to do one more thing left. And that is, I need to use a bracket around the structure. And you're going to do this for all ions, whether they're cations or anions. You're going to put brackets around the structure. And then up here in the right hand corner, top right hand corner, you're going to go ahead and put the charge on the ion. That allows us to know not only is this an ion, but that it's a negatively two charged ion. It has two additional electrons added to it um, in order to help it get full valence shells going on here. Okay. By the way, this is known as a polyatomic anion. A polyatomic anion. We'll talk more about polyatomic anions down the road here um, in this unit. Okay. But there it is polyatomic anion. Um, it's got the correct structure, everything's arranged right, everything's got the correct number of valence electrons, we've got full shells, we got the brackets, and we got the charge, and everything's labeled correctly. Now, if you want to, you can change the bonding electrons to, to dashes, right? And so I can do that really quick. I can make that into a double bond, and I can make this into a single bond and another single bond. And it would look like that when I'm all deaf. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Now, what do we have next in your um, study guide? Uh, you have on the next page um, several uh, structures that I've given you. And what I want you to do is pause this video right now. Please do this. Please take the time, to pause the video. And I want you to draw the loop structures for all of those in the appropriate boxes, okay? Um, there's several of them. So go through each step one at a time and uh, draw the loop structure in the box. And then um, when you're all done, turn the video back on and um, let's, we'll go over the answers, okay? Good? All right, awesome. All right, so pause. All right, did you get them all done? All right, let's uh, let's go through the answers now. Uh, I really hope that you. Uh, took the time to really do, to do it and at least to tap those problems. Um, so what we're gonna do is go to those problems right now. All right, this is, we already went through these. Carbonate ion, okay, so here we are. All right, so let's run through. I'm just going to draw the Lewis structures um, here on the on the screen, and you check yours to to the ones I have. And um, if you need to to redo yours, um, then you can do so. But make sure that you really can do it. So um, if yours doesn't really match with mine, you might want to go back and retry it again. Okay. So the first one, hydrogen is going to look like this. And I'm just gonna put a hyphen where we would have um, dots, two dots, okay? For oxygen, you should have a double bond, oops, a double bond between the two oxygens. And you should have lone pairs, two lone pairs on each of the oxygens, okay? For HCl, 
you should have a single covalent bond. And you should have some lone pairs around that chlorine like so, okay? For nitrogen, you should have a triple bond, yep, a triple bond between the two nitrogens and each nitrogen would have a lone pair on it. Okay, so far so good, hopefully. Um, if not, go back and uh, try these structures again now that you got the answer. Okay, and then sulfide is going to be sulfur. It's gonna have a hydrogen and another hydrogen. And then it's gonna have a lone pair and another lone pair. It looks a lot like water actually. Okay, which actually should make sense because sulfur and oxygen um, are both in the same uh, group on the periodic table, right? All right, so then let's go to methane and we're gonna have carbon in the center and then we'll have hydrogen single bonded, another hydrogen single bonded, another hydrogen single bonded, and then finally the fourth hydrogen also single bonded like so. Okay, there's methane. Um, ammonia, NH3, you're gonna have, oops, sorry, I was gonna draw lots of dots. Now, if you have the dots there, it's perfectly fine. No problem, I'm just speeding things along by putting the hyphens. There's one there, one here, and one there. And again, it doesn't matter if you put the hydrogen up on top, you just need to make sure that you have three hydrogens bonded around nitrogen, and then there should be a lone pair um, on the nitrogen, okay? All right, let's look at this next one. This is, this is an interesting structure, okay? Because you can sort of make two structures out of this. That's correct. So you might have chosen to do this, And the sulfurs will have electro, oops, I don't want that. I'm bad right there, get rid of it. Okay, the sulfurs will have a couple lone pairs like so. Now, uh, this is one possible structure you could have drawn. Um, probably most of you did this structure. It looks very much like CO2, right? Again, sulfur. Um, and oxygen are in the same uh, group. So bonded to carbon, it would probably look very similar, all right? But you might have also drawn something like this where you made a triple bond between the sulfur, the lone pair, and only a single bond like so, all right? So you could have drawn either one of these. And for right now, Either one will work, okay? We'll, we'll soon get into trying to decipher which one of these structures is the better one to represent um, uh, uh, CS2, okay? But for now, you could use either one. And then finally, the last one, we should have a triple bond between the carbon and nitrogen, the lone pair on the nitrogen, and then the single bond with the hydrogen, like so, okay? So that, that's the answers to those problems. Um, again, if you did not get one of those, please go back and try again, use your steps. Um, and if you still are having problems, then um, we'll talk about them in class. Um, come see me uh, and we'll, we'll discuss that, okay? But uh, that, that's those practice ones for right now. All right, we have one last thing we need to talk about that's really important to understand uh, that sometimes, sometimes, not all the time, but it is possible that we might have um, a molecule that actually violates the octet rule, okay? There are some elements, um, especially elements in period three and beyond that can have what we call an expanded octet, which means uh, that the that element can have 12 electrons or even up to 
14 electrons around the central atom. Now, typically this will only occur around the central atom. Um, you do not really see extended octets for elements that are not central, okay? So um, extended octets, there are a variety of reasons for it, but the main um, important reason for the ability for certain atoms to form extended octets is because they can tap into their d orbitals and they can make uh, covalent bonds with their d orbitals. Now, most of the time, as you'll see in, in the coming lessons, that uh, covalent bonds are being formed with s and p orbitals, okay? But with certain elements that have electrons in their or half filled d orbitals or whatever, there is a possibility that um, covalent bonding can occur with d orbitals, okay? So um, more on this later, but for right now, just visualize that yes, there are exceptions to the octet rule. Um, and that is there is expanded octets, that's what we call it, an expanded octet where certain central atoms can have more than eight electrons around it, okay? It, usually it's up to 12, but sometimes even up to 14 um, around that central atom, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna practice um, some structures uh, going through our rules, and we're gonna show you that going through the rules, you can still um, figure these, these ones out, okay? That have extended octets and, and get the, the, the problem right as long as you go through the steps that I've given you, okay? So we're gonna start with uh, arsenic pentafluoride and I'm gonna go back to the board again and uh, go through the steps and, and draw these, okay? So let's do that. All right, so I'm going to raise our last structure here. All right, so we are doing arsenic pentafluoride, right? So that has a formula of ASF5, okay? Now, the good news is is that we don't have to modify any of our steps. We can follow the exact same steps that we just learned and practiced using it for these elements that can have ex expanded octets, okay? We still are gonna count up the total valence electron number. That's always going to be the first thing. So take a moment and do that. Um, take your five fluorines, add up the valence electrons for those five fluorines, and then add it to the total electrons, valence electrons for arsenic, okay? Do that and I'll be right back. All right, you should have calculated 40 valence electrons. That's a lot, okay? 40 valence electrons. Um, but uh, you know what? It's an even number. So this is a possible structure that we can do. All right, so we're gonna play by the same rules. We're gonna go to step number two, and we're gonna pick a central atom, right? Is it gonna be the fluorine or is it gonna be arsenic? Well, arsenic needs more electrons in its valence shell uh, to fill it than fluorine. So we're gonna put arsenic in the center. And so now we've got step two done. We're gonna to go to step three. Remember, now we're gonna form the covalent bonds, right? So I have, going to form a covalent bond here with this fluorine, um, another one with this fluorine, another one with this fluorine, and another one with this fluorine, okay? That's four, and then I need another one, so I'm gonna put one right here, and that's okay. It doesn't matter, you could have put it anywhere you wanted, it's just as long as it's bonded around the central atom, okay? Good, now, 
I'm going to take and go to step four because I've bonded all the rest of the atoms around that central. So now step four, I'm gonna count, count up the uh, electrons that I use to make the bonds, the bonding electrons, and subtract it from my 40. So I used one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I've used 10 out of the 40. So I'm gonna subtract 10 and I have 30 electrons left over, okay? 30 electrons now to play with to finish up the structure, okay? So I'm gonna do exactly what I did before in step five, and that is make lone pairs around the outside atoms, that would be the fluorines, and then work my way to the center. I need to make sure the fluorines have full valence shells or octets before I can move on. So I'm gonna start with this fluorine here, and I'm gonna put two, four, six, eight around that, okay? And go to the next flooring, two, four, six, eight, okay? So now I have eight electrons, eight electrons, and another two, four, six, and now I have eight, look at that. And then another one. And then finally, the last flooring, Okay, that, Ooh. and honestly, I've used up all 30 of my electrons at this point, all right? And you can count them up. Um, I should have 40 total electrons, valence electrons here around um, this structure, okay? So I don't have any left at this, at this stage, okay? So everyone has a full valence shell. All the fluorines have full valence shells. But arsenic not only has a full valence shell, but it has additional electrons, right? It has two more electrons than it needs in order to have a full octet, all right? In this case, arsenic is having an expanded octet. It's making a covalent bond with its D subshells, okay? Um, helping out the additional fluorine there, all right? Now, this is allowed because arsenic is on period four, right? And a lot, most of those elements on from period three on down can have extended octets. And arsenic is one that commonly does that, okay? So this is a correct structure. I'm gonna change the dots into dashes now, so you can kind of see uh, the bonding with the dashes what that might look like instead of using dots here, okay? So something like this, right? And there's arsenic pentafluoride, all right? And there's its structure. Again, it's okay to have an extended octet for some of these, okay? There we go. Let's try one more. See what's the other one I chose? Um, I chose uh, hexa uh, fluoride. Okay, no. Our, is it sulfur hexafluoride? Yeah. Okay. Sulfur hexafluoride. Okay. SF six. Okay. So again, we're going to go through our steps. Valence electron total. Count them up. All right. Got them. 48 electrons is what you should have. We're gonna pick our central atom. Sulfur is gonna be the central atom. And then we're gonna start making our covalent bonds. All right, and I need some more. So I'm gonna put one here and another one. Uh, let's do, actually, I'm gonna spread these out. I'll make them diagonal. Like so, it's a little easier to bring this in. Flooring there and another flooring there, okay? So hopefully you see those dots. Make them bigger. Okay, so that you can see those dots around it. So essentially around that sulfur, um, I have one, two, three, four, five, six covalent bonds that definitely is going to exceed the octet rule, okay? 
And so sulfur is going to have an expanded octet here. So I've used up 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 12 out of the 48 electrons, okay? So how many electrons do I have left? Um, again, take my trusty calculator and 48 minus, minus 12 is 36. So I have 36 electrons to play with at this point. So now I go to step five and I place the remaining electrons around the outside atoms first to give them full shells as lone pairs. And then I can work in the center if I need to. So start here, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then another six for this fluorine. Another six for this fluorine, okay. Almost halfway there. Another six. Right, we're almost going to have 36 here. And then I have six left over. There's 36. So I've used up 36 total electrons for the structure. So everything's happy. Sulfur was already got a full octet right away, right? So we're, we're good with sulfur. It's just that it has more electrons than it normally would need. And that's because it's building those additional bonds with its D uh, orbitals, okay? So at least it has its valence shell filled and now it's uh, helping it's filling some of those D orbitals up with bonds, okay? Um, now, I can go ahead and again, make some dashed lines in here so you can see those better. We got some dashed lines and uh, there we go. Sulfur hexafluoride. There's its Lewis dot structure, okay? So those are the only two that I'm gonna go um, over right now. Um, we'll, we'll practice some more um, in the as, as time comes. Um, I do want to, to make mention one thing though. If you did have any additional electrons left over uh, from our total amount and all of the fluorines were all completely full with their full shells, I would place any additional electrons on the central atom as lone pairs, okay? So if I had two electrons left over here for my total, after all said and done, I would just place a, a lone pair on the central atom, like so, okay? And I know it makes it a real extended octet, but that's what I would do, okay? Now, Typically, you wouldn't do that for a structure that's already got um, essentially four electrons over as it is. But um, if you ever did have um, extra electrons left over, place them as lone pairs on the central atom, and you're good to go. Okay. Hey, that's it. Um, that's the the basics and the basic ideas of drawing a loose structure. The the biggest thing I can tell you right now, besides practice, 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 is to follow those steps, those six steps that I've given you, and uh, you should be really good to go with anything that I throw out at you or what the AP or IV exam throws out at you, okay? So that's it for this lesson. Um, we'll call it good, and um, I'll see you uh, next time then.